dear people, welcome to this session uh, in the series African uh, Big Seminars. We uh, have a series running up in the ASCL for uh, prominent speakers in African studies and adjacent fields uh, and share some advanced uh, insights into African studies as well as problems on African development, etc. Today, we are very, I'm very glad and honored to have with us as our guest, Dr. Richard Tinkoda, who is a political demographer and works as a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center in uh, Washington, DC, at the Environmental Change and Security Program, and is also a fellow at the Stimson Center in Washington, DC. Uh, Richard Tinkoda has done exceptionally original work, I think, in demography and social political analysis and in particular has convincingly argued for the development and use of age structural theory that tells us more and often in a real predictive sense about long-term undercurrents in developing and developed societies. Such work, I think, can serve as a realist corrective to the often unduly optimistic development talk and surface analysis on current global issues and changes. Dr. Sinkara has a long and distinguished research career of a fascinating variety. I looked at your resume, it's, it's your <laughs> many, many things. And is currently participating in two ongoing research projects with the Atlantic Council and the Population Reference Bureau in the US, uh, which focus on the demographic transitions, influences on political, social, and economic change. Dr. Sincara is a prolific author, and his essays frequently appear on the Wilson Center's new security beat, an interesting blog. He also maintains the political demography website. One of his most recent papers there was entitled Population Age Structure, the Hidden Factor in COVID-19 Mortality. Also a very interesting study. So Richard, uh, welcome to the African Studies Center. And I'm very glad to, to have you here. And I uh, will keep my mouth shut and I'll get you the floor. We talk about 20, 45 minutes and then we go to question and answer immediately after your presentation. That's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you so much, John. It was the nicest introduction that I've ever gotten. I must say. <laughs> it was true. original, it's and uh, it, it suggested that you actually looked at my stuff. And I know we've talked, and uh, that's very, uh, very complimentary. And I'm honored to be here to this audience. I, as John knows, I don't very often speak to academic audiences. Most of the audiences that I work for or talk to are. <clears throat> intelligence people. I worked in the intelligence community and uh, uh, or their defense intel uh, defense analysts or uh, very often um, planners. You'll see the planning aspect of this. Uh, but recently people uh, interested in policy have come to me and, uh, and uh, we're working on some things together, which is the Population Reference Bureau's work. Uh, and I'll maybe talk a little bit about that if I have the time. So I'm gonna start with four questions. I'm going, to, I'm going to answer them and very briefly actually. And these are the four questions I'm gonna to try to deal with if I can get through the slides. Uh, first one is what is the demographic dividend? It's often talked about even by, by, by African policymakers and it is actually a group or a sequence of very favorable age structures, age structures that uh, facilitate uh, sort of fiscal, economic, and social development, uh, and even political development, as we'll see. And when is it expected to occur? And here I'm going to give you a tautology. It's going to occur in the demographic window, the title of this thing. So the demographic window is where the demographic dividend happens, and vice versa. You know, it just, it's, a, it's a term that the UN Population Division created, and it's, it's often called the, the, the demographic window of opportunity. Um, what is expected to happen when it occurs? Well, that's what basically we see after much debate is that countries typically don't do poorly and they generally make it to the uh, upper middle income uh, ca category of the World Bank's uh, income categorization. Uh, and I'll show you that. So that's where actually this sort of development occurs. I can't say it just jumps up there, but if you look at that window, inside that window, 
at least in, from the beginning of that window onwards, about 85% of countries that pass through there make it into the demographic window during that period. Uh, they make it into the upper middle income category, excuse me, uh, during that period. When will this happen to countries in the Sahel and tropical Africa? Well, it looks like um, it's gonna take a while for most of them. According to the UN population divisions estimates, probably between, we'll start seeing them between 2050 and 2075, most of them. There'll be a few before that, but uh, and I'll uh, indicate who they might be. Okay, so we'll move on. And um, what, uh, what uh, there's a, you know, I'm gonna show you sort of the, the, the results of, of, of statistical modeling and this statistical modeling is not the typical statistical modeling that academics are involved in. They are usually uh, trying to determine the factors associated with the phenomenon. They're, they're looking at the comparative strengths of those factors. And when possible, they're trying to find causes. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. I'm sure many of you do that. Uh, because my audience is different and my analysis is different, I'm more interested in timing. And uh, <clears throat> that timing is important to intelligence people, to foreign affairs and analysts, um, and for planners. So I not really, you know, I, 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 of course I'm interested in what causes it, but I think it's been, causation has been quite elusive in the social sciences, and particularly in state building. I think, you know, it's been about 70 years of arguments and none of them have been resolved really. So, um, what I'll do is move on and I'll show you what I'm talking about, essentially. Let's see. Oh, okay. I find this a little odd. And when I talk about timing, what I'm talking about is actually age structural timing. So we're not talking about chronological timing per se, which we are all used to. You're not going to say, well, and in, in, we are going to talk about that as well, but the, the analysis is in another domain. It's actually in the domain of this age structural uh, uh, timing. It's called basically uh, age structural time is really the change that you see in front of you in that graph, that geometric changes in the age structure. So what we have on this graph is at the bottom of the axis, we have people who are senior citizens and on the vertical axis, we have people who are young, below 30. And this is a picture of all the countries of the world in 2015. And you can see that countries start up at the top left to be very youthful. They have lots of, if you're familiar with population pyramids, that pyramid is, is, uh, is males on the left, females on the right, young people on the bottom and senior citizens up at the top and every little bar is a, is, is a, a five year uh, portion of the age structure. So it really is a bar, two bar graphs and they're put on their side, actually, if I can show you that. And, uh, and, and because it's done in, in proportions, in percent, all of those bars add up to a hundred and they all are comparable, even though the populations are different sizes. The, the, the age structures are comparable. So you can see the difference, really geometric differences in the odd shapes that, that happen. You started with the pyramids at the, at the top and then when you get to the bottom, you have something, let's say unusual <laughs> anyway. And um, if, now the interesting part about this is, let's see, I'm having a little trouble. Uh, there we go. Um, the interesting part is that if you follow this this gradient downward and it moves from the top left down to the bottom right and it moves because fertility declines. So if you look at this, this gradient, you'll see that countries up at the top behave very differently in many ways than countries do as you move through this, this uh, transition. It's called the age structural transition. You can see the arrow shows the, the usual direction of this transition. And if you divide it into four parts, which I do because I need to communicate this to people who are who want answers, essentially. They want to use this. They want to know something 
and they're not too concerned about, <laughs> about what happens right there, you know, if that's right, that the, the border lines are perfect or whatever. So I've divided pretty evenly among four, four regions. And, um, and what you find is that just grossly, that if you look up at the top left-hand corner, that's where revolutions, that is uh, interstate conflicts that are not territorial, that's where they begin. They, almost all of them began there. And when you get down to the next brown one, light brown one, uh, that's where they end. Most of them end right there. So if you look at liberal democracy, that is free and freedom houses indicators, that's what we use, um, you find that liberal democracies typically emerge in uh, and stay liberal democracies if they're in that second quadrant, that brown one. If you go back to younger, that younger quadrant, which is the, the reddish one, if you go back there, there are liberal democracies that emerge there. Countries do become classified as free, but they generally do not stay that way for more than a few years. 10 is pretty much as much as, much as you can see, uh, you, you'll observe. Very few examples of countries actually becoming liberal democracies in that first quadrant and sustaining them through the, through, until the second quadrant. So uh, there's some exceptions and most of the exceptions are small populations, less than 5 million. So you little islands and uh, et cetera. Um, so what I'm going to do is show you how we get from that picture to this picture, because uh, that was necessary to do this analysis. What we wanted to do is use statistics. And if that was the case, <clears throat> we needed an independent variable. And that we call the age structural domain, which is the median age from 15 to 55 that covers that segment and a little bit more that covers the age structural transition. Uh, <clears throat> and median age being the, the, the age of the person who's in the middle of the distribution, 50% are younger, 50% are older, and then, the, and then probability being on the, the vertical axis. So ultimately we're gonna to get to a point where we'll see that, that I'm gonna be using logistic regression, an old way to use logistic regression to make some logistic curves. And that's what I'll try to get to, to uh, quickly. Anyway, this, these, these divisions, as I said, have borders and, and, and the borders, actually the one between youthful and intermediate is pretty good. Uh, the other ones, they're open for discussion, but um, I drew those borders to be exact lines and they can't possibly be exact lines because I work with people who wanna draw maps and they have to know. So we're doing the best we can here. And I've given them names because that ends the confusion. People will call just about any kind of country, whatever they want. And uh, so I try to force them to use these, uh, these uh, monikers, these names, which are youthful, intermediate, mature, and post-mature countries. So let's take a look just uh, at a tour of some of the countries that many of you have been interested in. And there is, uh, quite a, an array here I, or a spectrum from Niger, the most youthful country in the world and its distribution in 1990, 2020 and 2040. And then moving to Bangladesh, a country that was, looked just like an African country does today. It looked like that in, in 1980s and early 1980s. It went through a dramatic fertility decline that was sort of, I must say was a cooperation between the Ministry of Health and, and, uh, and numerous donors, the Netherlands being a, a big player actually. And, um, uh, and now it's got an age structure that we would call intermediate. It's, it's right on the, the cusp of, 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 of an intermediate age structure. And actually good things are happening. It's not no longer a, lo a low income country. It's classified by the World Bank as, in, as a lower middle income country. So things have changed. And um, finally, the Netherlands, which in 1990, you could see its post-war baby boom had moved upward as fertility declined. And, um, and you can see it in 2020 right now, which has a distribution that is very similar to the US, would be almost indistinguishable actually. 
and one that uh, that uh, the uh, that Tunisia will have in about 2040 to 2045, around there. Interestingly, and then you can see it in 2040 what the Netherlands lo will look like uh, according to the UN medium projection. And let's just take a look quickly at another bunch. Now that you see how to do it, Kenya, which is going through, you look at 2020, it's going through a, a, a slow but steady fertility decline. It's, it's uh, uh, under four children per woman, I think about 3.4. And uh, Nigeria that has done very little actually in composite. There's differences between North and South, which are I think a bit alarming actually. And then South Africa, that is well into its demographic transition and well into its fertility transition and, and uh, <clears throat> its fertility rate is around 2.4. So you can see what it does to an age structure. You can begin with this extraordinarily youthful population, which is, you think about it, it's difficult to be a state. It is, you, you've got uh, under the, that, those uh, youthful distributions because you have rapid rates of workforce growth uh, work, rapid rates of growth of the school age population and very small uh, groups of people in the adult population to draw uh, adequate uh, teachers from. And, and uh, so, and, and that goes from almost all institutions. You've got lots of, most institutions are dealing with, particularly health, dealing with younger people and, uh, and, and mothers. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you're really at a you're really at a, a, a disadvantage, and and uh, with a very youthful population, and there's all kinds of other reasons, including instability, political instability that are associated with it. And but um, we'll move on, and we can talk about that. And here's what I'd like to show you about the four phases of the age structural transition, which is called the Global Trend Scheme. It's used in, by the U.S. National Intelligence Council as their way of dividing countries up and talking about them. Um, you can see that blue mark is, is, a, is where most North American and Western Europe, European countries are between USA and Netherlands. You can see it right there. And um, there are older countries in Europe, Germany, in Central Europe, and Italy and Southern Europe, uh, Spain, Portugal that are to the right are older um, and very few countries that are younger than the US actually that are in Europe or Australia, New Zealand, countries of European heritage. Um, and if we look there, here's where uh, the Sahelian countries are. Uh, Niger, uh, I'm sorry, Niger being on the left and Senegal on the right and Inside there are most Sub-Saharan African countries actually, particularly those in West and Central Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there's changes, of course, as you saw, dramatic changes in Southern Africa and changes starting to occur or uh, ongoing changes in East Africa. So that Africa is actually differentiating itself into in really into two, two groups. Besides North Africa and Southern Africa there, already differentiated. And here's, here's a, an example using the, because of the nice borders that I've drawn for those, you can take a look at the, at the world map. On the top is 1995. Um, and you can see still the remnants of what people used to call that developed and developing country dichotomy. That was that simplistic uh, way to, 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 uh, to divide countries. And already it was falling apart because you can see that China has left the and Thailand and uh, <clears throat> and 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 Taiwan have left the that uh, uh, that uh, youthful part uh, that youthful phase of the age structural transition, but it's still that kind of arc what we used to call an arc of instability that sort of goes through the center uh, from from uh, Latin America through Sub-Saharan Africa and into uh, <clears throat> the Middle East and, and South Asia. But we get down to 2010, things are changing. And uh, this, uh, this kind of change was recognized by the, 
by me at least, when I was in the National Intelligence Council. Not too many people believed me, I must admit. But um, in fact, they laughed, which was uh, that North Africa was becoming very different. And, and if you read some of my papers, and uh, this was, it just, people, uh, Middle Eastern ex experts didn't believe it, even though I gave talks on this and, uh, uh, and talked about Tunisia actually uh, before 2010. So this is a way to signal you that things are changing. Can you tell exactly which country is going to become a liberal democracy? Uh, no, you know the group of countries that are, may create candidates and you know where to look, um, but you probably have to know a, a bit more. And even if those people, they knew a lot about Tunisia when I gave talks, there were, there were, uh, at least, were talks to Arabists and uh, people who had grad students in the region and in, even in Tunisia, and uh, they were they were skeptical. So, if you the nice thing about this system is that we have the UN population division projections, so you can take this these uh, categories into the future. So, I've got you with 2015, where you see I, I I put that one in there because you see South Africa differentiating itself, and and Egypt remaining the same, which is I think. Uh, uh, showing itself that Egypt still has has problems with a very youthful population, um, but you haven't you don't yet see the East African dif differentiative. You look in twenty thirty five, and here's what we're looking at in fifteen years. Uh, still, countries like Afghanistan, Iraq, and Yemen being youthful, and uh, but we're seeing another kind of age structure show up, which is the post mature age structure, and we don't. Honestly, we don't know a lot. We, it's the frontier of dem demography. We can, we can guess, and that's what people do. They talk about institutions that may not be viable in that period of time and ways that we have to adjust, but we don't have any experience. And, and actually, if we, the nice thing is that we do have experience with the, the youthful and intermediate phases, some, more, some with the mature phases, you can see the yellow is the mature phase of the, the age structural transition. But if you look at that dark brown, which is in Japan and Germany, uh, through the Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, we just don't have any record of their performance. So uh, no matter what people say, they're guessing actually, but there's, there may be some very good guesses without data. Now, what does that, what do those quadrants mean really? And um, what do those phases mean? And so what I've done is take out the least populous countries, those under 5 million, and those countries with lots of uh, oil and mineral rents. And uh, I'm left with about 26 to 28 countries in each one of these classes, uh, World Bank income classes. And this is what it looked like in 2018. And you can see that it's, it's not deterministic, but what it is, is it's a good statistical expectation of where countries should be. It's one that we don't have otherwise, I would argue. And, and the fact that we have the UN population division estimates and projections, and they're good for about 20 to 25, maybe even 30 years in the future, that may be pushing it, but 25 years in the future, we can, we can ex look at those maps and, and expect things to happen. Um, and when they don't happen, we have a question, we have reason to ask, to ask why. And it does work out that way that countries don't meet expectations. And this gives us, uh, should give us a kind of a scientific approach to um, a problem that has largely been unscientific. Let's face it. I mean, a lot of, as, as, uh, and there's been books written about this, and there's a lot of political science we know is, is uh, talking heads. Basically, we get people who we think wrote a great book, and uh, they get up and talk, and then you believe them. Well, that doesn't work for the intelligence community, because a lot of those people have been wrong. So, so and, 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 and the response has been to this has been, well, you can't really talk about a country unless you've lived there for, you know, for five years or seven years or something like that, because we intelligence community does rely on 
country experts. Well, first of all, we can't all live in a country for five years, you know, that's, and secondly, uh, and secondly, a lot of those uh, country experts have been dead wrong. And this is, they're actually very right about the players of the present, very astute about the relationships with them, about them, and very wrong about what's coming down the pike. <laughs> so there's a, I don't know if you've read, read Philip, I recommend Philip's Tetlock's book. If I don't know if any, they should, it should be forced, forced reading <laughs> basically for, for area special inter, anybody's doing international relations or political science, read his, his uh, book on, um, on, uh, I can't remember the title of it, but it's called political strategies or political, political prediction. Uh, Maybe I'll forward that to you, but it's a, a Tetlock, T-E-T-L-O-C-K. He ran a, he ran, essentially ran a, uh, an experiment from 1980 to about 2000. And he, uh, he used some of what he considered to be some of the well, most well-known political scientists of the day. And they did no better at the end of the thing than in prediction than, um, than throwing darts at a, <laughs> at a dartboard by a chimp. They had, as he said, some people have said, no better than a, a chimp throwing, throwing darts. <laughs> so, uh, so this is attempts, you know, it's not perfect. It attempts to give you, give an analyst a, big, a little bit of insight. Um, ultimately, they're going to have to make some decisions, but this takes people a little bit further down the road and it's testable. And we've done that, and I did. I try to do that every time I come find something, and I did that with, with the North Africa, uh, and I did it. And and some of them don't work out as well as I I thought. But the fact is, we can test them and see what happened. And um, and the problem being is that you're very often working with small numbers of countries. For to make a statistical prediction with five countries, like I did for the North Africa. Uh, you're asking for trouble, but <laughs> nonetheless, uh, it, you have to do it. That's the, that's the scientific way to do it. Um, I won't spend much time on this one. Basically, what this shows and the other shows, this is the Human Development Index, and it's divided, again, along age structure on the bottom, median age, and you can see where the, the divisions are in terms of the uh, age structural phases. But you can see how Human Development Index works, 1980, oh, I said 19, 1990 on the left and 2018 on the right, sorry. And what's interesting here is, you know, people have talked a lot about how Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa has done well over the recent past. But here's the catch, is that it did well without actually advancing through the, demo, uh, the age structural transition. Fertility did not decline much during, particularly in that, belt along the equator. And what happened is, eight, if you look in the, the 2018, uh, at that, that blue arrow that says A, you can see that countries moved up, but they didn't move out. They didn't advance through the age structural transition and therefore they didn't move on that route to development. They just did better in, in their own little section, but it takes, uh, you know, age structure, the, the best way to put it is age structure is a constraint. If you're a youthful country, you're not going to, the lesson is you're not going to uh, make it into the upper middle categories of develop, typical development indicators, the fundamentals, education, child survival, maternal health, and there's a whole bunch of these. And he even, and we'll see even in terms of democratization. Now I'm gonna sort of shift gears and I don't know how well this is going to end up, but what we're looking at here is my vacuum cleaner analogy. And um, I'm going to do logistic regression. And the best way to explain that to people who don't have statistical background is to, um, is to think of, of Ivanka here. This really isn't Ivanka Trump. It's actually somebody who looks like Ivanka Trump, but it's an artwork called Ivanka Vacuuming. And 
she's moving to the right. And as she moves, she's picking up a, <clears throat> a pile of dust. And um, you can think of that pile of dust as countries entering a category. And as she moves to the right, you can see that graph, she is going to suck up that dust and that's going to create this S-shaped curve, the logistic curve. And, and that's what logistic regression does very well. It's, it makes a, what's called a cumulative distribution function. And um, that S-shaped curve shows you that when you start on the left at a, a youthful age structure, you don't have many countries that have entered that category at all. But as you move to the right, you start picking them up. And the, really, the, the, uh, the crest of that pile of dust, the crest of those countries, is at um, about 0 0.5 on the probability scale. And that's, a, that's an artifact actually of the, of the algorithm, but nonetheless, uh, that's where it is. And so, so that's how it, it makes its curve. Um, and uh, I can talk about that with somebody if they, they're really interested in how to use, I mean, there's been, people have been using, it. this was the original use of it and uh, people have forgotten it, but I, I like it. Um, and here are some of those curves. I've, I've, I've given you a, a real quick snapshot of child survival transition, the educational attainment transition, per capita income transition. So what we're looking at is how many children survive up to age five. And you can see that the classes that are taken off a WHO map, they sort of, they just line up as you go through the age structural transition, bing, bing, bing. You, they're very steep actually. And as you, same as the edu educational transition, I mean, it's a different, Categorization, categorization system, but nonetheless, it's a little bit uh, more like the income transition. And the income transition I'm using is the World Bank's. There's only four categories, and you can see them lower, lower middle, upper middle, and high. Uh, and um, let, me, let me show you how this works. So I'm going to go down to that third curve on the bottom, and I'm going to stick in Kenya, and it's Kenya about 10 years from now. And you can see it, it, it turns out a little different from, they're a little out of line, but the, it turns out a little different for, it's supposed to be in the same place all through these categories. And what uh, intelligence people do, if they wanna look into the future, they'll say, okay, how's Kenya going to do in terms of its income uh, in 2035? And they can see that it's about, median age is about 24, a little less than 24. And then put that line there and you can see that it's about, the you know, you can see that if I can use my arrow here, that up at the top, that line intersects about 30% probability of being low, about 50% of being lower middle, about 12% of being uh, in the upper middle category and about three, you know, 3% or so about uh, being in the high category. So you can see it gives, all it can give you is that kind of thing. And you're going to have to, that kind of set of probabilities, but that's enough for you to knowing something about the country, you know, or actually we should know already, Kenya is already a lower middle income country. So, so um, but the chances of becoming an upper middle income country in, 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 by, in 15 years is very low, actually. You have to, if it fought, and of course, the assumption is that it's going to follow like so many countries have in the past. Um, and it's a good guess. And you, you can do this for, here's what I did for uh, North Africa. You can see how this worked, is that uh, these are the curves for free, look down here. Uh, partly free is in the middle and then not free is at the above. So there, I've generated these curves and really the only one that's I like looking at is, is free. And if we put Tunisia here, this is where Tunisia was when it became a liberal democracy. So it was a little bit before this when the, when the uh, revolution, when uh, Ben Ali was thrown out, but uh, that's where it was. It was a good bet, decent bet. Uh, and particularly if you were lined up, I didn't say, I, I did say it in public, but I didn't write it because Really, you should look at that five countries, of course, North Africa, and I figured at least one, that's what I said, at least one should become a liberal democracy by between 2010 and 2020. Um, now, I'm pointing to actually this 
quadrant here. And this is the, in here, and uh, youthful liberal democracies are just unstable. And you know a bunch of them. Uh, Mali was there. Uh, Nigeria has been there. Sierra Leone has been there. Um, and the latest declines from that category are Benin and Senegal. Senegal is right on the cusp, I might add, but, but nonetheless, and it's fallen off before, but nonetheless, it's hard to stay a liberal democracy. The only one that's really done it is Ghana. So this is where it's not meeting expectations. That should tell people, hey, there's something unusual about Ghana. I don't know what it is particularly, but whatever it is, uh, they, they do rather well for being a youthful country. So um, instead, now I'm going to just kind of shift this to a, a much more, uh, you know, the four phases. I'm not going to stick in something uh, along this age structural transition that is heading to the right, which is called the demographic window. And the demographic window actually fits mostly on the, in, the intermediate period and a phase and sort of overlaps. And I use that because more demographers are, are familiar with that. Uh, and uh, it was, it's a UN, a UN population division invented it. And it begins at a medium age of 20, around 26 years and ends at 40, around there. Uh, the beginning is a lot more definite than the, than the end. And, um, we know from taking a look at how countries are lined up in 2020, that to get into that, that window, you really have to have a median uh, a fertility rate lower than 2.8. So you have to get below three. Uh, and once you get, you may get to below three before that, and, but what's happened is that your age structure will, as people age, that bubble that is at the bottom, that youthful uh, part of the age structure will move up and give you a bulge in the middle among workers and students, I mean, among workers and graduates, uh, making your age structure more, more mature, have more people who can work, less people who are dependent, more people who are educated actually, and that's been crucial. And you can see where, uh, where the, the Sub-Saharan African countries, they're all to the, most of them, the exception of Sub-Saharan, with the exception of, uh, South Africa and Mauritius. And I think that beginning one is, is eh, I want to say Botswana, just right around the, that line. Anyway, you hear Botswana, it has not made it. So I, I'm skeptical about that one. Maybe that's Djibouti, actually, that's Djibouti. So um, uh, here's a different way to show this. Here's change in the five, uh, on the vertical axis, we have change in, 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 in every five years in median age. And at the bottom, we have median age. And, and we can see there's sort of a, what you could call an arc. What happens is that um, once countries can sort of burst out of that bottom corner where, they're, where fertility has not declined much, where the age structure is not advancing, uh, they tend to rise up very quickly and um, and then the growth, uh, I'm sorry, change declines. And, and the, so the European model, at least, the Western European model has been the countries head downwards then. East, East Asia and, and Eastern Europe have continued to mature, which I think is maybe a, a warning, but uh, this is the shape that they take. And uh, so you can, if you look forward, you can see where countries are projected, at least by the UN population division projections, which are not always right, but they're right and uh, a lot. <laughs> they're very, they tend to be very good. Uh, unfortunately, they have, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has uh, not sort of uh, followed them very well. It's been done more poorly than, than expected. But you can see where those countries, if we look at the median projection, you can see the, where the UN population divisions says they'll enter that demographic window. And it's, for some countries, it's as early Ghana, as early as 2040, if it lives up to its projections, and Kenya. Um, but for some countries like Niger and, uh, and, and Senegal and Zambia, uh, it's a long way off, even though you hear 
hear African policymakers talking about this thing that's that that they think they are experiencing, and what they're experiencing is actually much more difficult situation on the youthful side of the transition. You can see Senegal what it looks like now and what it will look like if it, it lives up to those projections as it enters the demographic window. It's be vastly changed in its age structure down there at the bottom. And here's an example of how badly some countries have done. Here's, you know, if people think, oh, the medium projection or the high, those are, that's how things happen. Well, actually they take a lot of effort and they've taken an extremely lot of effort for, for uh, Sub-Saharan African countries to uh, live up to. So um, particularly those along the equatorial band in Sahel. Uh, so he, this was Niger in red is what they, expected of the high, low, and medium projections in the 1996 revision of the UN population division uh, projections. And what we're living with today are projections that are vastly less optimistic. You can see them in black up above. Things are, the country is growing, has extraordinary momentum, and I haven't talked about momentum, but uh, so, so just as a last slide, I'm gonna show you the sort of the problem set of, of uh, a political demography. And that is the way to look at it is to look at that graph I showed you of the change in median age versus median age, this, the, the age structural transition, the, what's called the, the age structural domain on the bottom and the arc that Western Europe has gone through. That's how it's followed. And uh, that's a nice model to look at. It never, you can't, the demographic window is a great place to be, but you can't stay there. <laughs> That's the unfortunate part about it. Wasn't Oz like that, I think. <laughs> so, so um, uh, this is what it, this is the path. And uh, what happened, what the problems are that one, here's one that Africa is, is persistent youthfulness because we know that if you stay persistently youthful, you grow very rapidly. You have extraordinary rapid, rapid urban growth. You have conflict. You have a high, higher likelihood of having a conflict than <clears throat> your more mature neighbors. And uh, they tend to be more persistent. This is interstate conflict. Just only interstate conflict I'm talking about. Revolutions and uh, separatist conflict. Separatist conflict's a little different, but I don't have time to talk about it. <laughs> so um, the problem, the other problem at the other end, and, and interestingly, African policymakers talk about that. We don't want to get into rapid aging. We don't know how to do that. Well, you're not even close. Don't worry about it. It's like your, it's like your five-year-old, your your five-year-old coming home and telling him that you're worried. He's worried about uh, dementia. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not even close. Was, these countries are almost a century away from worrying about that problem. Um, the other problem, if you can see that green arrow on the bottom is one that Africa is probably gonna deal with. And you can see it in Nigeria. It's where countries have a youthful segment or a youthful ethnic population uh, and another uh, group of, of ethnicities that are going through the age structural transition. So, you're divided in Nigeria, North and South. And then finally, that's it. And um, I'll just uh, leave it there, let, let you look at that map. That's the map of 2015, pretty much what it looks like today in terms of the structural phases, uh, youthful red, uh, intermediate brown, yellow mature, and uh, brown post mature. And there it is on the bottom in 2035. So I thank you for your attention. There you've seen it. You can, fortunately I'm not there. You can't throw things at me, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I think, um, yeah, take a look at that and uh, I'd be happy to answer the questions that I can and, and tell you where my, my own doubts are, where we've had success, where we haven't done so well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.